look. She's not gonna find out. It doesn't matter as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. Are you serious? God never said that. Sorry, is this hurting you? <laughs> All right, we're continuing with our series called God Never Said That. These are great vignette videos I found, and they, they, they deal with some of the myths that we believe about God. The very first week, we, we had the myth that people believe that God said, God just wants you happy. And we learned that sometimes what we think is happiness is really not happiness at all. It's a mirage. It is a uh, candy-coated arsenic that can actually hurt yourself. God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to have a good life. But sometimes we think our happiness is the utmost of what God wants. No, God wants us to be holy, which means purposeful, means full of life. We mentioned that. And then the second week we talked about, people say, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. And that's another mis misnomer of the Bible. The truth is, we often get things in life we can't handle. In fact, the great men and women of history that have made a difference in God are the ones that realized they didn't have what it took, and they had to rely upon God, and they went beyond the natural confines of their own ability and did extraordinary and supernatural things in life. And so if you're not being pressed beyond your natural ability, then you're not really functioning in the power of God as you can. So we mentioned that. And I encourage you, you can go back to our website at cornerstonecheshire.com. You can download the message or watch them and catch up to the series. Today, we're going to talk about something you probably heard about, and it's this. It doesn't matter what you do as long as no one gets hurt. We hear this all the time in our society, don't we? Hey, it's no big deal. What I do in the privacy of my own home or my own business, it doesn't make a difference as long as no one gets hurt. It makes no difference what you do. But the problem with that is not, first of all, God didn't say that. The second thing is, we don't always know the collateral damage that is affected but with interactions with other people. In fact, I would, I would venture to say that everything you and I do affects somebody else in one way or another. For example, if I choose not to work hard, what happens? I could lose my job, right? Or I could cause problems. If I choose not to drive the speed limit and drive recklessly, I could hurt somebody else. Well, I'm just, or if I'm dishonest and if, if I steal from somebody else or I'm dishonest at work, I end up costing the company more money and they have lesser profits and they have to lay people off. You see, all this stuff, your life is, affects somebody else. We don't live a life in a vacuum. And so God never said it doesn't make a difference what you do as long as you don't hurt anybody. You see, society often says this. This is the unpardonable sin is this. Don't you dare call anyone a sinner, right? And unfortunately, I would say that the church sometimes gets a really bad rap because I've met a lot of church people that are always upset. You're a sinner. Oh, you know, God's going to get you. And sometimes the church uh, depicts God as an angry, a cantankerous old man with a cane that just is upset that you're having fun, and he's going to whack you over the head if you have any fun. And we're supposed to walk around miserable. We're supposed to walk around like, oh, I'm holy. But nothing could be further from the truth. God is the God who designed the word fun. He's the one that gave us all the pleasures of life. He's the one that made the things we enjoy so much. And so we believe there's an enemy out there that tries to get us to do the wrong thing to self-destruct our lives and other people. We really believe that. And so that's all part of it. And so people often say that. They say, you know, you can't call someone a, a sinner. As long as you don't hurt anyone, it's not a problem. And I would say in our culture today, the number one thing I hear about is this, about justice. We should... We should what? Be tolerant of everybody, right? You hear that all the time. We gotta be tolerant. I have found the people that scream tolerance the most are the most intolerant people I've ever met. If we don't say what that person says, that, well, you're, you know, you're a bigot or whatever you are, you're, you're, you're lazy, they'll call you many things. We need to be tolerant of each other. But if someone asks us, we ask someone else to do something they don't like, they get upset with us. So tolerance is the big thing today. It doesn't make a difference what you do. It doesn't affect anybody. But the truth is, it does make a difference. We often don't call sin, sin. Um, the Bible says this, judge not, right? 
So we have a heart. Well, you shouldn't be judging anybody. And sometimes we don't call sin, by the way. It's not, sin means missing the mark. It means doing something that is actually destructive either to you or somebody else. And that's what sin does. Sin is a bad thing. It doesn't help us at all. For example, uh, we often have nice names for things. So, for example, if I take uh, illegal drugs or I take, do a lot of drugs, I do recreational usage. What's that? I, I, recreate, I have recreation, recreation drug usage, which basically means you're, you know, you're snorting, you're, you're whatever, popping, whatever you're doing. Or how about this? Uh, sexual sin. We often call it, well, uh, I'm having an affair. It, it sounds real nice. I'm having an affair. Instead of calling it what it is, it's adultery, right? Or we call hooking up. Hey, I'm just hooking up, which basically means fornication, right? But hooking up sounds a lot better than that. So we often do that. Or uh, some other things we often do is, um, for example, there's really violent entertainment that hurts people. Now that we call it adult entertainment. We don't call it pornography. We don't call it, um, we don't call it uh, horrible violence. We call it adult entertainment. And so we often supersede and gloss over stuff that's destructive. And the problem is this, is that God made us, he loves us, he wants the best for us. He's called our father. And we're like a three-year-old playing with kitchen knives and saying, don't tell me what to do. I can do what I want. And we're, we know we're cutting each other. We're hurting each other. And a parent would be very upset at a child playing with knives or playing in the middle of Interstate 84 or even at Route 70 where people go 70 miles an hour, though it says 40, right? You don't want your kids out there playing, but people say, I can do what I want to do. And God's a loving God. He doesn't want to see you hurt yourself or other people. And so this is why he has these things in the Bible. He's our creator. He made us. He knows what works and what doesn't work. And so there's natural laws, the law of gravity, for example. If I drop something, it falls. Well, that's hateful that it dropped. No, that's called gravity. And, you know, it, the Bible talks about that. So there's, there's moral law as well. So the Bible says this in 2 Timothy 4.3. It's on the screen. You're going to follow along or check in your Bibles. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to tell them. All you have to do today, whatever you believe, go on Google, and you'll find a support group. You'll find somebody that will teach that what you're doing is okay. You, know, just, you find it all the time. The truth is this. Sin is real, and it has consequences upon our lives. It really does. And also, it also has something called possible damning qualities to it. Literally, it can keep you out of being with God forever in a place called hell. Now, I know that's not very politically correct, but hell is not what you think. It's not some guy with a red jumpsuit <laughs> laughing around with a pitchfork in his hand and everyone having a good old party. No, I'll tell you what hell is. Hell is the absence of God. It's the absence of hope. It's the absence of peace. It's the absence of anything good. Can you imagine having no hope? Waking up in the morning, there's no good news. There's nothing good going on. The Bible says it's like a burning, and I believe it's even worse than fire. You can see different areas of life where there's been hatred and, and uh, ethnic cleansing. Well, that's a little bit of a foretaste of what hell's like. Take all love out of the quoting. Take all hope away. Take all peace away. And my friends, that's what hell is. And the Bible says it goes on forever and ever. And God's a loving God. He does not want to see us go through that. And that's why we're alive. He wants to give us an opportunity to find him. So sin is real. And there's consequences. But there's often cultural misbeliefs about sin. The first one is this. Hey, I'm not a bad person compared to everyone else. I'm not that bad of a person. I got a dear friend of mine, a brother, dear friend. And uh, he was, uh, we went to a gas pump. How many of you enjoy driving uh, when people are kind of cut you off and trucks get on your tail and I I've been known sometimes to you know just to kind of get a little agitated I've gotten better and uh, let's say I I'm not always the best um, person I should probably wear a clerical claw when I drive I'd be driving a little better but I used to be worse I've gotten a lot better but when someone cuts me off or something happens or there's a truck behind me I'm, I'll tell you the truth sometimes what I'll do is put my foot in the accelerator and then I'll put the brake on to scare the truck behind me get off my back yeah, I know. 
So if that was you, I'm sorry. But I've gotten better, and now I've learned to let it go and say, God bless you. What's the universal sign if you make a mistake? You just go like this, you go. And you know, that's what I... But uh, I have a friend of mine that went to a gas station. It was a long line. And just as he gets to the pump, some guy cuts in front of him and goes to the pump. So my dear friend brother gets out of the car and goes up to him and says, it's a good thing I'm a Christian. Oh, I'd, 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 I'd rip you apart. And the man goes, well, it's a good thing I'm a Christian too. <laughs> so they're both, they're both upset with each other. And my brother's, oh, I shed it, my brother. Anyhow, <laughs> my brother's ready to, you know, my brother's a big burly guy. He's getting all upset at him, my, my brother David. And they go, well, it's a good thing you're a Christian. A good thing I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a good thing I'm a Christian too. What church you go to? They become friends in exchange. <laughs> so I can do that. I hope my brother David's not watching. But uh, I thought it was a funny story. Can you imagine that? But how many times you and I act that way? We do things, and we do things that are wrong. We do things that we're not perfect, are we? We make mistakes. None of us are perfect. And we often find someone else doing something wrong, and we don't find it wrong ourselves. It says in 1 John uh, 1.8, says this, if we claim to have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. All of us, if we're really honest, mess up. Yes, we sin. And by the way, sin means missing the mark, doing destructive behavior to your spirit, to yourself, and to other people. And it's against what God would have for us. The Bible says this, though. This is good news. If we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in us. There's a dear uh, person we like to, I quoted a couple of weeks ago. His name is Ray Comfort. And we got it in our Bible school. Here we have a course that Ray Comfort teaches about that. He says, listen, it, I've seen people say, how are you? I'm a pretty good person. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Have you ever lied before? Well, yes. Okay. Have you ever been angry at somebody and wanted them to die? Yeah, according to Jesus, you've murdered them in your heart. So that makes you a liar and a murderer. And so basically, if you think about it, none of us are perfect. Every one of us make mistakes. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, that's not a real popular thing to say, is it? No. But until you see yourself as a sinner, you can never find yourself as a savior. Now, the good news is God's not out to destroy us. He's out to save us. And the reckless behavior that you and I allow in our lives, God wants to cleanse us from that and give us the real reason for living, which is to live for him and to find the freedom that's for him. See, another thing is this. Romans 3.10 says, All scripture, as Scripture says, none one is righteous. No, not one person. Listen, no one has it together. No one has a monopoly on proper behavior or etiquette, all of us have messed up, including myself, all of us have. And that's why the good news is that Christ has come because he loves us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to give us a life that is lasting and true, both here and now and forevermore. But sin separates us because God's perfect and we're imperfect. And so there has to be some kind of intermediator to bring us there. And that's through Jesus Christ who pays a debt you and I cannot pay. And another misnomer is this, all sin is the same. No, it's not. All sin is not the same. God never said that. Well, let me say this, sin separates us from God, whether it's a little sin or a great sin. If I drop an arsenic drop in a glass of water, whether the whole cup is full of it, full of arsenic or just a little bit, it's contaminated and will cause you to get sick or die. And so a little bit of sin or a lot of sin can cause us to be separated from God. And so all sin separates us from God. However, there's different consequences for sin. Let me give you an example. We talk about driving the car. Now, if you get upset with somebody and perhaps use gestures that we're not going to do in church at someone, okay, that's, that's not a good, good idea. But if you get a gun out and shoot someone because you don't like the way they're driving, how many folks know that's a lot different? Both are sin, but they have different consequences, right? That's obvious, but why do we think it's all the same? It's not. So all sin is not the same. Who are you to judge me? God never said that. The Bible does not teach that sin's the same. You see, unforgiven sin leads to death. 
And so the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So how do we get influenced by our actions? Well, there's consequences on earth. If I am, if I'm, like, for example, if I drive and I'm reckless, going 120 miles an hour on Route 70, and I'm, acting, I'm texting when I'm driving and, and eating a bagel, whatever, and I'm doing all that, and I crash the car, and I lose an arm, okay? God will forgive me, but guess what? I'm for the rest of my life, you're going to lose a limb. That's a consequence of sin. Or if you hurt somebody else. So your actions have consequences, even though God forgives you, okay? There's consequences on earth. There's also, the Bible says, there's rewards in heaven. The Bible says that great is your reward in heaven. If you bless those who curse you, whatever, you do good things, God will give you a reward. Now, you can't save yourself because only Christ can do that. But there are rewards for behavior. And there's punishment in a place called hell. Okay, we talked about that. Now, it says in Luke 20, verse 46, Beware the scribes. And by the way, the scribes were the religious pastors of their day. Okay, they were the pastors. They were the priests. They were the religious professional clergy, if you will. Okay, beware the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogue, and the best places at feasts, who devours widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. So that's why long prayers are not good, or long sermons. I'll be good about that. These will receive greater condemnation. So God, as Jesus is saying, listen, the religious crowd that think they know everything so well, they're going to receive greater condemnation than others. So all sin has different consequences, this side of heaven and the other side of heaven. The Bible says this. Jesus was being uh, tried by Pontius Pilate, and this is what he said to Pontius Pilate. In John 19, 11, he said this. Then Jesus said, you would have no power over me at all unless it was given to you from above. Now, this is the major thing here. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. So Pontius Pilate had a sin, but the people that handed Christ over had the greater sin. Do you see that? All right? So there's different levels of sin. All sin separates us from God. You can't earn your way into heaven, only what Christ has done for you. However, there are consequences for your sin this side of heaven and, and the next place. Okay? Make no mistake about it. The Bible says in James 3.1, I don't like this one very much, but I'll read it. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive stricter judgment. To much is given, much is required. And so I'm more responsible in the area of spirituality because I represent and help train others in spirituality. So I'm, I'm at a higher standard in that realm, you see? And so there are different realms in that, in that thing. The Bible also says in Matthew 5, 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So he talks about a rewards in heaven. And finally, in this whole thing about not all sins are the same, let me explain something to you as well. This is what it says. This is, a, this is a very troubling verse, but it's true. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says this. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against, this is interesting, your own body. Now, why would the Bible say that? Well, first of all, let me say something very clear. God created sex. He created husbands and wives together. He made all the nerve endings. He made everything fun. He made the romance that whole loving feeling, that whole thing they make songs out of. Okay, he created all that. He knows the proper context into which it was designed and made. The Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You see? And then they're not two, they're now one. And so God created this. Why? Because he loves us, and it's what? They call it procreation. As a result of a husband and wife coming together, they make life together. He also made it for pleasure. But guess what happens? The two become one flesh. So what happens? You become one flesh with somebody, and you break up. <laughs> You're leaving a piece of yourself and not of the person. And that's why it's so, and you know what I'm talking about. If you've been around for a period of time, if you've been sexually active in a relationship, and you break up, it's a lot more painful than if it was platonic. Why? Because two become one flesh. Now, God loves us, 
And he's designed on one man, one woman, one lifetime. But when we choose not to do that, we hurt ourselves. It's hurtful. The good news is God forgives us of those things. That's the good news, okay? That's the good news. But the bad news is it still hurts. For those of you who know that maybe you, you've gone through divorce, it's, it's not fun, and some of it wasn't your fault, and we're not here to condemn anybody, but you know how painful it can be during holidays, weddings, right? It, that's a pain, and it's difficult. Okay, God forgives and gives new days, but there's still consequences. When I grew up as a child, a teenager, ah, all sin's the same. Okay, you lusted in your heart, so I might as well sleep with her. So, and that's the kind of stuff we used to say in college, by the way. Yeah, that's a, a conversation with some Christian guys in college. Well, you lust, so what's the difference if I sleep with my girlfriend or not? Well, there's differences in it. Both are lusts, both separate us from God, but there's consequences, right? There's disease, there's emotional difficulties. And a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists tell us because of the sexual promiscuity in our culture today, it causes a lot of mental health problems. It's scientific. It shows it that it actually really affects people. And this is why the Bible says it. You sin against your own body. So there's different levels of degrees in that. So it does matter. Yes, it does. Sin has consequences. How about King David? People say, well, King David, he killed a man and slept with another man's wife. But God still used Jesus through his line. That is true. But he died a man of many sorrows. He was... An old man couldn't keep warm. He was cold. His son tried to kill him. He went through rebellions. He went through difficulties. God forgave him. But there's still consequences he had to pay in his lifetime. So God loves us and doesn't want to see us get hurt. He's like a good parent. Listen, I don't want you not studying for your test and you flunk out of school. You can't get a job. I care about you. I don't want you taking drugs and, and doing all these things because you're going to ruin your life, right? As a loving parent, you want to love your kids. Well, God's the same way. He doesn't want to see you hurt yourself. He loves you too much to see you hurt yourself. So it does matter, my friends, and for you young people especially, I used to believe it didn't make a difference. It does make a difference. Let me repeat for the third time, all sin separates us from God, okay? But sin has different collateral damage this side of heaven, and your behavior does matter in the next life. Okay, this is another one people say. It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you don't hurt anyone. Well, we know that's not true. Also this, since I'm already sinning, I might as well continue to do what I'm doing. Since I'm already um, promiscuous, I might as well continue. Since I'm already not reporting my income to the government, and after all, you know, they do things that are not right, I'm going to work under the table, even though the Bible says, render to what God is God's, and the government, that's the government's, I'm not going to listen to that. And so we start to do these things. Well, since I'm already uh, doing that, already, I'm, I'm already a flirtatious, I'll just continue. I'm already promiscuous, I'll just continue with that. No. Listen, there's a new day. God can make you as clean as the pure driven snow. You don't have to live with guilt and condemnation. None of us are good enough, but Christ makes us good enough. And that's the good news. What does Romans 6, 1 through 2 say? It says this. Well then... Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? You see, God has saved us from a sinful lifestyle. Why should we continue in it? God doesn't give us grace so we can hurt ourselves. He gives us grace so we can become better people and become more full. This is the whole issue of that. You see, spiritual maturity is not about how much you know. It's how much you apply and obey. I really believe that today in our culture, in the church culture in particular, we know a whole lot more than what we're doing. And un unfortunately, have you noticed this? We tend to think, if I can regurgitate, if I can answer back to you something, I know it. For example, in school, you study, when was the War of 1812? It was in 1812. You get it right. Okay, because you can regurgitate what it says. Two plus two equals four. Okay, you got it right. You got the grade. But my friends, you and I really don't know something until we actually do it. And so many times we know more than we do. And we, we're more educated beyond our obedience. But you know who the most miserable people in the world are? It's not unbelievers that are, that are doing whatever they're doing. No, they're having fun. Well, I'm just saying, they are. The most miserable people in the world 
are believers who know better and choose not to do the right thing. And their conscience is searing them because they know there's something better. Maybe some of you are playing around with God. Maybe you're involved with relationships you shouldn't be involved with. Maybe you're seeing things and doing things you shouldn't be doing. And you're miserable because you know there's something better for you. You see, too much is given, much is required. And so another problem with sin is it's progressive. Have you noticed that? You might just start doing something. You might start lying. The next thing you have to set, tell a lie to cover the other lie. Then you have to lie again. And then you don't know what you're saying. And you can't even tell the truth anymore. And so that's all part of it. I love what it says right here in 1 Corinthians 10.3. You're going to ask the worship team to make their way back. It says this. 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as was common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, that was the scripture that was misappropriate. People say, well, God will give you more you can handle. Yes, he will. He's saying temptation won't be more than you can handle. The truth is, you and I both know before we do something wrong, this just happens to me. I, I, I used to have a fast trigger in my tongue. <laughs> Imagine that. Now I'm perfect in that area. All right? So I'm all saying, I, I'm like, <clears throat> I'm going to just tell, don't say it. <clears throat> don't say it. You know, I hate to be honest, but just tell you something. Boom, and I say it. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about? I don't want to say it, but you say it. I, I don't want to do this, but I do it. And in many ways, I, I, this illustration is so true. How many of you have ever been on the highway? You're driving, and it says, this happens to me all the time. I have women controlling my life. Siri tells me what to do. My wife tells me what to do. My GPS tells me what to do, right? All these female voices tell me what to do. Well, get over. Exit 26 is coming. I know, but I want to pass this truck. Ooh, you know, and passing the truck, and all of a sudden the truck comes, another truck comes. There's exit 26. I can, I, can, I, I can do it. I can make it. Let me pass them. And what happens? I miss the exit. And, and now that I miss the exit, I have to go and exit down. Now, in New Jersey, this is horrible. In New Jersey, you miss an exit, you're going 20 miles, right? And then they have those Jersey barriers. They're like, oh, my goodness. And so it's so often, you see, here's a warning sign. Get off now. And when you miss the opportunity, it's so much more difficult. So the Bible's saying, when the opportunity comes, don't mess with it. Put your blinker on, slow down, and get off the exit while you have a chance when the, when the time of escape is passed, it's virtually impossible to stop. You see? And that's what the Bible talks about, that no temptation has overtaken what is common to man. But God is able. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able, but will provide an avenue of escape. And that's why we need each other. You see, Jesus is a friend to sinners like myself. I'm a sinner saved by Christ. And now I'm a child of God with a sin problem. One concluding verse, 1 John 1, 6 is this. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You know, I don't know about you, but when you're doing something wrong, you don't want people around you. The Bible says... But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You see, we're not called to live this life in Christ by ourselves. We're called to live in community, to encourage each other, to help each other out, to be able to call someone up and say, listen, I'm struggling with the situation in my home life. I'm struggling in this situation. I don't know if I can be honest anymore. I don't know if I can go on anymore. Help me. And someone else can stand alongside of you and say, I'm praying for her. I can help you through this. But the Bible says this, verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Now, here's the good part, folks. I love this. If we confess, say, I'm wrong. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all sin unrighteousness listen I don't know where you are today but some of you are like I don't like to hear this but someone something inside saying I, I agree he's right I believe that God's calling me 
and I've turned away from him. Listen, what we have to do is this. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can never be good enough. But Jesus paid the price. He's paid a trillion dollars that you cannot pay. So whether you have a hundred dollars or a million dollars, a trillion dollars does not make a difference, does it? But Jesus paid the price for us. And so if we will confess with our mouth that He is Lord, we can begin a new day in Him. So I'm going to pray right now. If you want to bow your head in quietness to everyone else, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you pray this prayer with your heart and mean it, it can be a new day for you. Lord Jesus, just pray in your own heart quietly. Lord Jesus, I know you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I choose this day to make you the Lord, the boss of my life. My life is not long on my own. I trust you and I give my life to you today for the first time in Jesus' name. If that's you today, just with every head bowed, just real quick, and I count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so I just know how to better pray for you. If, if you've prayed that prayer, okay. Anyone else here today this morning? Say, that's me. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Okay, let's, 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 I want to pray for the rest of you right now. How many of us, myself included, maybe we're doing stuff we shouldn't be doing. We're, we're believers in Jesus Christ. We love God, but we're allowing stuff, maybe dishonesty. Maybe we're flirting with people we shouldn't be flirting with, looking at stuff we shouldn't be looking at, drinking what we shouldn't be drinking. We're doing stuff, we're just honest. Listen, the Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God wants to give you a life worth living, and sin separates you and gives you unnecessary pain and suffering. So let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray for the rest of us here today, Lord, myself included. Lord, we all got stuff in our lives that we're allowed. We're allowing sin. We're allowing bad attitudes, unforgiveness difficult ish, the other things we're allowing in our lives that are causing us to be separated from you. Father, we confess our sins to you today. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. And I just pray these strongholds will be broken off in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask if we all could stand. We have a closing song. We're going to ask our prayer team to come up. If you prayed that prayer today and ask Christ in your heart, or if you want someone to, to come along and pray for a situation of a job or a sickness, we want to pray for you. Ask the prayer team to make their way down. We're going to have a closing song, and at the end of the song, we'll dismiss you, but if you want to stay longer, you can. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before God Almighty, may his grace, may his love, may his power be with you all.
in Jesus' name. You're dismissed. If you need prayer or want prayer, please come forward. We want to pray for you. Otherwise, God bless you.